My topic today is what I call the Bible bait and switch. The phrase bait and switch is comes from the world of sales, and it's where a customer is lured into a store with a deal that seems very attractive, but then they find it's not what they expected, and the salesman tries to steer the customer towards a more expensive purchase. An example which comes to my mind, which may not be the best, is that let's suppose an automobile sells for $30,000, but an ad appears where it says $20,000, brand new, current model. The man goes to the store and the salesman says, well, yes, we do have this car for 20,000, but I have to tell you, this particular car was in a flood. It was underwater for two days. Uh, we're selling it as is. The manufacturer is not giving a warranty on it. I would certainly wouldn't buy this car. But we have these cars uh, factory fresh for 29,000 and tries to steer the customer towards purchasing that, that car. That's a bait and switch. How does that happen with the Bible? Well, let's imagine a man who grew up in a secular household Perhaps he's in his 20s, 30s, and he's beginning to think about life and death and God, and he begins to come, become interested in religion. So he walks into a church, and in that church, he uh, meets the pastor, the reverend, whatever, and he is told about the Bible. And the Bible, he's told, is the very word of God, has no error. It's the supreme standard that we should all follow. So the man thinks about it, he attends services, and uh, there's a sermon which says that we should love it, uh, one another, and that comes from the Bible. And he thinks, well, that's a nice sentiment, that seems to be from God. And then maybe in, at another service, he hears that we should forgive. And uh, he thinks that's a nice sentiment too. But eventually he starts studying the Bible and he finds that Jesus says, do not take oaths. Well, people take oaths when they assume political office, when they enter the armed forces, when they're in court. So he goes to his pastor and he says, why is it that Christians take oaths when Jesus says not to? And the pastor gives him some sort of explanation. You can read this over here. At this point, if the man accepts that explanation, who or what is he following? Well, the switch has been done. Now he's following the pastor. Jesus, in what is allegedly God's own words, and Jesus is God. So Jesus is quoting himself in his very own book saying, don't take oaths. But this man has been convinced by his pastor that it's okay to take oaths. Well, that's fine, except he's not following the Bible. He's following the pastor. That's a fact. Now, it's not necessarily a bad fact. It's just a fact. Uh, the, the Bible is a very large book, and um, it has things that are good and things that are not so good. For instance, in the Old Testament, you can read that a child who curses a parent should be put to death. Here's one quote, and here's another. Whoever curses his father or mother shall be put to death. Now, people who have had children know that growing up is difficult, especially in the teen years, and uh, if a child curses a parent, it is wrong to put that child to death. Um, now, a Christian might say, well, these two verses are from the Old Testament. But unfortunately for that exp explanation, here is Jesus himself in the New Testament, specifically saying that God commanded to put a cursing child to death. So in this case, it's a good thing I think that the man is not following the Bible and following his pastor. And um, if he were to take this to the pastor, it'd be an explanation. Here's one I found on the internet, which you can look at and you can do your own research. But uh, pastors, reverends, preachers have an explanation as to why a child who curses a parent should not be put to death. And that's all well and good. It's all fine. I don't think a child who curses a parent should be put to death either. But I know what the Bible says. You can read it yourself. So it's good that in this case, people are not following the Bible. Uh, by the way, I found something called hypnotic bait and switch. I don't think that's quite the right term that I would use for this. But it does seem to apply in that 
if you make two or three or four uh, statements which someone accepts as true, then that kind of builds your credibility. So if statement number five is false or shaky, you're more inclined to believe it than if you had started off with that statement. In any case, the bait and switch happened when this individual thought he was following the Bible. But after a while, he was following his preacher. Which, as I say, can be good or bad, depending on what the Bible or the particular scripture that an individual thinks he's following says. In the Old Testament, there was um, an account of Moses going up to the mountain. And in the meantime, the people worshiping a golden calf. And that angered Moses because they were worshiping an idol. Well, I would say that when people say that the Bible is without any error and it's the supreme standard, that instead of worshiping a golden calf, they're doing this. Okay, thank you for listening.